to The Writing Life, interviewing real writers about making a living from their words. Hi, this is The Writing Life. We're here with Yamuna Vengapal, who's currently working on a collection based on the cultural intricacies in India and their emotional impact on people's lives. I'm Kitty. Inez is here with me too. Hi. So, Yamuna, it would be great if we could hear you reading some of your stuff now. Hi, I'm going to read an extract from uh, the published short story Abstract Art. And uh, these are a few of the entries from the protagonist's diary. Bad day. Met a guy and actually liked him, but he didn't like me. His mom had told the broker that he was looking for someone fairer. Am I only what I look like, eh? Why do guys not see what I'm inside? My intellect, my heart, and these mothers. They choose fair and plump girls with little or no brains, and later when she chases them out of the house, they cry and blame their sons. I want a guy who feels that I'm beautiful as I am. Someone who sees through me and loves me for all that I am and all that I am not. The weight is killing me. Today's state, glum. Today's my birthday and I'm fucking single. My parents are so happy. Will you believe me if I say that a guy is coming home tomorrow? His parents had visited a few days back. I thought they were dad's friends. I'm terribly nervous. If the guy likes me, they'll get me married in no time. My mom is so picky even about small things like my sari and jewels. I can only hope he turns out to be good, or if he's not, then he shouldn't like me. Today's state numb. I'm going to get married tomorrow. No bliss, no awesome, only fright. My friends tell me that men will want to have sex on the very first night, especially Indian men. All they do in their years of being single is imagining up this night of how they lose their virginity and rob their new wife of hers. It is their fantasy come true. They'll never miss their chance or be patient. What if he... Today said, scared. Thanks, that was fantastic. So let's jump straight in. You gave up a very successful job in engineering in India to do an MA in creative writing. Why did you do that and why now? Well, I think sometimes you ought to feel really genuinely interested in what you're doing. I mean, it goes beyond the point where a heavy bank balance doesn't make you happy. And you have everything, but you still feel empty. I think I reached a point there before a year and a half back. So I quit the job to pursue writing. Fantastic. And why did you choose to come to England rather than staying in India to study it? Well, I think in India, creative writing as a course is yet to develop. And there are very few courses and none of them are degree courses. And none of them are PGs. So I thought coming to England may give a broader picture of what I'm working on and uh, how th an international audience would react to my stories. And being away from India would also give me a broad-minded view of the things I'm writing about. So what would you say are the main differences between being a writer here in England and being a writer in India? Well, in India, writing as a profession is yet to be recognized as a profession. Mm. It's still an art but something that you pursue in your free time. So if someone says, I'm a full-time writer, it's something that either you're crazy or either <laughs> you're very famous. So I think that's the main difference. And here you have so many support groups, like workshops and all that, writing mm. groups, and that's still lacking in India. Mm. And I think that's something we writers, young writers, have to work upon to build it up. Brilliant. I had a look at your blog and you describe yourself on there as a die-hard feminist and your writing is often a, a social political critique. Would you say that that's the value of creative writing for you to be able to convey social commentary beyond the story you're telling? Well, rather than seeing it as a social commentary, I would see it as things that affect me. I, I grew up in a household where people, females from my neighbourhood, come would neighborhood would come there to talk to my parents and grandparents about the injustice that's happening to them which are just stories and for me as a child when I listened to it they were just sad stories but when it happened to me I realized how unjust it can be and how it can affect a person just because she's belonging to a female gender so I think 
when I'm writing about some things that affect me, that that kind of gives a satisfaction. Mm. So you would say, like, as a writer, emotions are the most important thing first for you, like, not facts. You have to feel it first. Yeah, at least then... for me. If I don't, if that thing doesn't affect me, if mm -hmm. I'm writing a happy story and I'm not happy about mm. it, well, I don't think I can convey it to the reader. So when you're writing something like a, a poem, what's the process for you? Do you find a feeling and then build a story from that? Or how does that process work for you? Is that only for a poem or a short story? Or a short story, yeah. I think there has to be something that catches my attention or maybe that stays in my head for a long time. And it's often it's a single line or a, even a single word. Mm. And then it goes. And your poetry and short stories have been published in various literary magazines like your poem God Bless You in Yaria magazine. What was the process of doing that? I uh, send it out relentlessly. I keep sending it out to one magazine after another and I should say it is a... Sometimes you lose hope with because you, the number of rejections you get is extremely high when compared to the number of accepted things. But I think we should keep sending it out because everybody's got rejected at one point of time. Oh yeah, then. definitely. Mm, yes. And you have even been approached by an agent. So how did that come about? Uh, when my short story was published, the editor of the magazine had contacted me saying that one of the agents was interested in contacting me. So that's how she came to know about the story and she asked if she could be my, if she could represent me if I had a novel. So mm -hmm. having your work uh, published in literary magazines has actually been hugely beneficial for marketing yourself as a writer. Yeah, it is. Plus, it is a way of sh showing my works capability or what should mm. I say the values to people instead of saying that I'm able to write such stories and of course it's nice to have a few magazines in your biography. Absolutely <laughs> yeah. And what do you think about literary contests? Have you ever entered any literary contest? Oh yeah a lot of them. <laughs> I, have, I haven't won anything yet mm. but I hope to do so someday but one thing that bothers me is the uh, entry fee, mm. which is quite high in most of the literary contests. Yeah, I mean, I understand we are all students at some point, or yeah. when you are not very famous, or yeah, when you're doing some shitty job to yeah, keep your writing really like, going on. Yeah, it's expensive. Yeah. yeah, so perhaps then social media is a, a good free kind of added way of marketing your work as well. And you're very active, I see you all over Twitter and blogging and Google. Plus. You're very visible online. How important do you think that is for an aspiring writer? Well, I think it is important because I do understand that, I mean, I do agree that we do not write to just get published. It's more of more of the reaction of the reader that makes us happy. And I think getting yourself to be known and getting people to read your work, that's kind of a satisfaction that I get. So I think social media is helping me do that. So I have observed, like, in most of your short stories, you use first person and you also write from a female, young character point of view. Is it something like you like, like um, being in someone else's skin? Why female? Okay, I think being in first person gives me an opportunity to be emotionally close to the character. Hmm. Uh, female, why I write mostly in female is something that's something I know. And the hmm. way we think, the way we react to things and the emotional quotient of the things that comes to uh, fixes I think to a certain extent I know because I'm a woman so that is easy and first person is it's easy to slip another story beyond the story what the character is narrating us we mm. get to get the judgment of all the other people through the character and the character as well from what she's saying so mm. I like first person so using this perspective and giving a, a voice to a young female in India, mm. I think that your your topics often brush on being potentially controversial. Does that ever bother you that you might alienate some readers or do you just write what you want to express and, and don't worry about how people will react? Well, we all have our uh, choices of reading. For example, I'm not very much psyched about sci-fi. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not particularly interested in or I should say particularly affected by who will read my work or what 
audience uh, should I concentrate on? I think a good story, if it is a good story, it will get the uh, recognition it deserves. And I do understand if someone doesn't want to read, uh, say, a collection of short stories based on Indian females that will obviously be given in the blurb or the review and they'll have a chance to choose. So I think it's mutually good. So you don't think about a, about an audience when you are writing, like it's not important to you, not especially? No, not not, not particularly. Hmm. You also have a blog. If we visit it, what can we find in this blog? Well, I should admit the fact that I, it's not been used for the past one year where I've been doing the MA. Because <laughs> I was more uh, into writing my own short stories. Hmm. But I used to keep the blog, blog running before that year where I, where it is the random thoughts or the random things that I observe in an Indian scenario. Mm. Mm. And have any of those things that you've written about on your blog inspired your short stories this year? Yeah, the things that I write about in the blog are things that affect me as well. And those are, though they are non-fiction and just facts, my stories are drawn from the qualities or what should I say, the basics or concepts that are there. Mm. So, yes. So, would you advise any aspiring author or any author to open a blog to market their jobs? Do you think it's a good tool? Well, rather than seeing a blog as a marketing tool, well, it can be used as that. But I see it as a way of getting your thoughts together. Mm. And not every idea of yours can turn into a short story or a poem. But to decide whether a short, uh, an idea can turn into a poem or a short story, I think it's good to write it out and experiment it. Mm -hmm. So I use a blog for that. What was the reaction of your readers in the blog? Did they encourage you to keep writing? or? Uh, first of all, uh, <laughs> in the beginning it was only my friends who visited the blog. Mm -hmm. Though now the thing has changed, which is nice. But yeah, most of them, it's not that they have to, because it's creative non-fiction, most of them did not agree to the things that I've said. But it's good to know that uh, know all the all the different points of view, and it also helped me develop this kind of being away from the work and seeing it, seeing the work as your work and not the criticisms being directed at you. Mm -hmm. So that and which helped me in the course as well. So mm. I think that's a good thing. And have you found English responses different to to an Indian <laughs> or, audiences? Was it more positive, or were they unable to connect with your work? I did think before coming here that it would be difficult for me to impart the feelings to make them understand but after coming here I realized that we all human beings are same in one level yeah. so though the things are different it's not the same it's not the same scenarios it's not the same environment that people are extremely different from India but the feelings are feelings I mean if someone slaps you you get angry and that's not something hard to convey. What was harder was the reactions to the conditions. People didn't believe that it's still the same. I mean, how things were here in 1940s is how things are, certain things are in India. And that's what people thought was difficult to believe. But mm. And it's an important it's, message to, to yeah, get out. Yeah, I do mm. think so. So at this point, would you say, like, as a writer, would you like also to publish, let's say, in United Kingdom or, you know, like, for a British audience as well? Apart from an Indian audience. Oh, I'd love to if someone gets <laughs> <laughs> an international yeah. Yeah. thing for that, but let's see. Mm. But how have you found it um, coming from a multilingual background, coming to England where doing an MA course, other people on the course might expect to read English English, whereas you're writing in Indian English. How have you found the responses to, to that? Well, people have said that it's nice because it's got its linguistic charm mm. and uh, certain things that may not be particularly, what should I say, the in, in Anglo-Indian delicacies mm. that are there in my writing. Is, some people tend to be good, Re their reaction tends to be good, so mm. I'm happy about that. Yeah. Mm. And do you think it's important in this... Um, competitive writing market these days to have a unique voice where people can read and say oh yeah that's very Yamuna-esque. <laughs> well as long as your unique voice affects the reader I think yes. 
Hmm. You're a very busy person as well. Um, you volunteer for a host of different things like Northwest Literary Salon and you also are working on your MA. How do you find time to write? Do you have any routine? No, I'm actually a very lazy person so I don't have a routine and I cannot write when I say I'm going to write from 5 to 7 every morning. Sometimes I sit and write together for hours together and sometimes it just from 5 a.m. till 7 a.m. <laughs> Is that your your peak writing time? No, I, I would like to do that, but I cannot do it because... Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I cannot do it because it just doesn't come if I'm going to schedule my writing things. Sometimes I write from uh, in hours together, but sometimes just two lines a day. Oh, Depends upon I'd be it. writing two lines a day if I woke up at 5 a.m., definitely. <laughs> But is there anything like helps you to write, like let's say listening to music, drinking coffee, anything? I think if I watch or read something that really affects me, mm. so I connect it to something else in my short story or my mm. story or a poem and it helps me work on it better. So could you give us an example of, of something that you've watched or read that has inspired a story? Uh, the, sto uh, the movie Revolutionary Road. Mm. That's something that's deeply affected me. And when I was working on that, working on a short story, and when I got stuck in between, what do you call a writer's block? Yeah. And mm. so I watched the movie, and it, and it kind of, I have a few movies that I watch over and over again to get that kind of feeling that mm. helps me write better. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Like, it's a very strong movie. It really moves you, so... The story isn't something that's extraordinary. It's mm. just said in an extraordinary way that kind of yeah. affects you deeply yeah. for a very long time. So what do you think is success for a writer? Like, when will you feel you have achieved your goals? Or like, is it when you have published a bestseller? Or when you get your film deal? Or when you just can make a living on writing? Well, I think first time when I read one of Charles Bukowski's poem, I didn't even know that such a guy was there. The first time I read the poem, I I had I forgot where I was and I forgot that people were around me in the bus and I just started sobbing. I think that's the kind of response I would like to bring and I think that's the kind of success I would like to have. Mm. I might make money, I might not. I might have my book made into a film, I might not. But I think if someone reads a story or poem of mine and then thinks, Oh, something has changed in me. Mm. That would be success for me. Mm. Wow. And I hear you're, you're working on a new novel at the moment. Can you tell us a bit about that? Uh, it's a psychological thriller. Mm. Well, I, I wanted to write a literary fiction, but that takes a very long time in thinking. <laughs> so I thought I'd better go with a psychological thriller that's mm -hmm. set in 1950s in India. Oh, wow. And um, I think that that genre is becoming increasingly popular. We've had Gone Girl, Girl on a Train. Are you influenced by other writers like that? Or do you, do you try and separate yourself and find something new from that genre? Well, I think the, what's different is because it's set, in, it's set in a tribal area and it's not, and there are certain witchcraft things that are involved. Mm. And I think because it's new to the... Uh, the tribal things are mostly forgotten or considered to be backward in India. So I think it would be new to both international audience and Indian audience. I mm. hope so. Fantastic. Is it also going to have a female main character this time? Yes, it does. <laughs> so thank you, Yamuna. It's been wonderful to speak to you and find out all the different things you're you're working on at the moment and thanks for joining us yeah thank you thank you so much for inviting me thank you and now yamuna please would you read another piece of your writing hi uh, this is another extract from the same story that i read earlier we giggled like 17 year olds and this was how we fell in with, with each other in tiny ways saying good morning and good night waving while i left for work writing her name on my car's dirty back window, packing lunch, helping her with dinner, watching movies together, taking a walk at night, doing our laundry together in our huge washing machine, buying a ring and rose for the Valentine's Day, eating from each other's plates, holding her hands while crossing the road, sleeping closer at night. We called ourselves friends and shared jokes and stories. 
I asked if he could change the painting in our bedroom. She replaced it with a Radha Krishna painting. Radha and Krishna curled up on their sides to watch the moon over the distant mountains. She said she always wanted to ride in a bike with her guy. We did a research on which bike to get, had arguments and settled for a bullet. She had an accident in ninth grade when riding with her brother. She had no major injuries, but her brother had four surgeries. So she was naturally afraid of two wheelers. She wrapped one hand around my belly and the other around my shoulder blade tightly. When I broke, she clutched. It was bliss. By the time we were preparing for our Veronica honeymoon, we were more than friends. I never read that diary again. I didn't have the need to. It still beats me how we became intimate in just a month. My clients abroad were shocked to know that I had an arranged marriage. How can you marry someone you hardly know? Well, honestly, I don't know. Indian marriages are a one-time affair and barring a small percentage, arranged marriages are here to last. Maybe it's the celebration, the countless rituals and ceremonies before and after the wedding that creates an unforeseen yet rare bond. Maybe it's only about it's not only about the bride and the groom, but also the family, parents and values we long to cherish. Maybe it's that he or she is the chosen one by God. I grew fond of her and knew she had of me. And there was this bond, knowing each other's priorities and wishes without having to state them. My guess was right. She didn't need me, but she wanted me. We held hands, kissed in darkness and cackled over silly things. Initially, it felt awkward and perverse, but soon we fell into, rit- into a rhythm of sorts and looked forward to every day and night. We knew things about each other that nobody else knew and always said the right words that left the other amused. You have been listening to The Writing Live. Now we want to thank to Teresa, our editor, and Yvonne, the creator of the show.